going, but I have been very encouraged by it um, these last several, couple of weeks. Second uh, Thessalonians 3 is where we're going to be at this morning. And it's kind of, you know, when you come down to the end of a book, it, it's going to be kind of the last little marching orders, right? It's kind of the last little hoorah. Paul has probably addressed some issues in the church, and now he's saying, well, here's my final word. It's like yesterday we were uh, doing bitty ball, right? And, all right, so the little ones. There's a big difference, right, from twos and threes and uh, the four and fives. And the twos and threes, you're lining them up, positions and all these different things, and they're lining up, and they're just kind of, you know, all right, let's do it, right? They're just kind of staring at you like we have no idea what to do. And then uh, you tell them, you know, okay, you're playing defense, so get, get big. And they're like, all right, right here. And then uh, they start bringing up the ball, the other team, and they're just like, all right. And they look at you, and they're like, what do we do, right? I'm like, get big. What? What? Oh, we're playing. Okay. And they start running. They start going. They're like, okay. So we're trying, Bill and I are trying to give their final march and we're just like, whatever. Uh, all right, let's, let's just move on, right? And, and all right, so many times as we come to these things, it's like we read it, we can understand it, and sometimes it seems like it can go in one ear and out the other, or maybe I'm the only one that feels like that. But the book of Second Thessalonians was meant for the church. That means it's meant for you and I. So what Paul is going to address today um, is for you. And he's going to hit some hard topics, some things that uh, sometimes can make us feel rather uncomfortable. Uh, but uh, I think they're going to serve as an encouragement to you as well. So as we jump in here, remember the words of Paul so that we might live, as I wrote there, an extraordinary Christian life, which you will see in the eyes of the world is very much an ordinary life, right? But you'll see what I mean here in a minute. Go to 2 Thessalonians 3. I'll pull it up there for you as well. First marching order he gives us. <coughs> Stay faithful. Stay faithful. All right, verse 1. Finally, brothers. All right, he's summing it all up. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. <coughs> As happened among you, and that we may be delivered from the wicked and the evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing uh, and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. All right. We begin this morning with an example of humility, don't we? What's he say? The very first thing. Finally, brothers, what? Pray for us. And I, I thought, you know, we read that and we kind of skip over that little bitty part. He's asking for prayer. What's the big deal? But for as we read that, I, it served as a reminder this week that it's okay to ask for prayer. It's okay to ask others for prayer. It's a, an example of Humility, and it's an opportunity for others in the church to come alongside you and say, yes, we need to pray about this together. This is important to you. We need to lift one another up. It's just another example, as we're going to see here in a few minutes, of an example of humility by Paul in this letter. And specifically, here's what he wants prayer for. That the scriptures would spread rapidly. That the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. He wants to see the gospel go forth. He wants to see it grow and people understand it. And come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He's praying that there will be deliverance from the, the, the wicked men. The, the evil one, right? Uh, most commonly known as Satan in the scriptures. But also that there are others who are giving Paul problems. He's in a kind of a house arrest as he's actually writing this and there are people coming at him and he knew that church had been going through so many things that they were being persecuted and dealt very harsh treatments and in the middle of that what's he say? God is faithful God is faithful and I know I've talked about that a lot 
And there's a couple reasons for that. And the first one is this. We can look for faithfulness in a lot of different places. But the problem is um, people will let you down. I can say I'm going to do something, forget about it, I get distracted or whatever, and I forget to do it, right? People are not always faithful. Our stuff is not always faithful. I'm trying to get something to work on the TV the other night, and I'm just messing with it, messing with it, and Titus is trying to help me, and we're going through all these things, and I'm like, it's just not working. I need a minute, right? Go for a walk, and then come back, and obviously it just magically works all of a sudden. That's how those things go. They're not faithful. They can't be trusted. Our stuff is not faithful. But time and time again, I hope you see, in the scriptures, God is a God of faithfulness. God is a God who is always there. And here's a list of the, some of those times. I'll write some of these down if you want some scripture references to look at later. But here, here's a few. His faithfulness is not limited to time or space. Psalm 119.90, your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. His faithfulness is for believers, for Christians. Deuteronomy says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. His faithfulness equips you for what we're talking about, for ministry, for, for living out this Christian life. 1 Thessalonians, he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. His faithfulness helps you fight temptations. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. If you don't mark any other ones, mark that one. This is a great verse. It says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation... He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Temptations will come. Struggles with sin and the temptations to sin will come. You, you can expect it. They, they will come into your life. And he doesn't say he's going to take the temptation completely away, does he? He, he doesn't say that in that verse. But what's he say? He will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure. We don't have to sin when temptations come. We can say no, because God is faithful. His faithfulness motivates you to endure suffering, just like we've seen in this passage. First Peter, therefore let those who suffer according to God will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And finally, Paul's message is clear. When these things, life happens, what do we do? We turn to the faithfulness of God. Because God is always faithful. We have this, we have this little book, uh, these little board books that we got, I think when Libby was little. And, and one of those is that. It, it says God is faithful. So when we're going through, when they're real little and Zach's going through them now, we, we'll read those and it's God is power. No. And there's several of them. God is strong. No. God is kind. No. It's talking about the attributes of God. God is love. No. God is faithful. God is always faithful to his own. So, for us, what do we do? We first stay faithful to him, relying on his faithfulness in our lives. Second, here's the second marching order. Work hard. Verse 6, it says this. Uh, a little lengthy here, but stay with me. It's all there for you. It says, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from <coughs> us. For you yourselves know you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any. It was not because we do not have the right, 
but to give you in our, ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. All right, a lot here. Let, let's jump into it, all right? Because obviously the theme that he's getting at in this passage is the concept of work versus idleness. So we're, we're going to jump in because this is certainly a command. Now, when Paul gives a command, he was given apostolic authority, all right? So Jesus made him an apostle. He appeared to Paul, converted him, made him an apostle. Uh, so when we read a command by Paul... We should be reading a command as though it is Jesus giving us that command. Because he gave him the authority to do just that. The scriptures are inspired, so we know these things are from God. So we have a command from him that we need to pay very close attention to. And here it is. Keep away from any brother, or you could say, or sister, who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition you receive from us. Keep away. What's that mean? It's someone who is not living for Christ. They have allowed sin into their lives, either purposefully or unpurposefully, and they are unwilling to repent. And uh, I'll show you how that looks here in just a minute. If you remember, back in 1 Thessalonians, there were some problems in that town with people not working. They were, they were what I call moochers, right? It's like the the kid who walks around the table and just kind of takes a little bit of your food every couple minutes, right? Zach will make his rounds and just kind of grab something off the plate, and now he's taught the dog to do just that as well. So it just kind of moves, right? They're not actually doing anything to help with dinner, but they're like, I gotta have one of those, I gotta have one of those. Mom, I'm hungry, mom, I'm hungry. That's all the time, right? He's a moocher, he's not really a worker, he's not really helping, and probably a good thing, he's not really helping in any way, because who knows what it would be, but, we're not talking about little kids, are we? We're talking about full-grown people in that church who were believers who were not working, who were not providing for their own. And Paul, to counter this, says, I hope you catch this, for you know yourself, for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle. See, Paul's traveling around, he's and there were churches that provided some assistance to him that, that helped him be able to do these things as a missionary, go to all these different churches across Asia Minor at that time and establish them and stay there and recover when he was almost stoned to death several different times. But what did he do? I hope you see the humility here. He was a tent maker. He worked, not because he necessarily needed that money, but why did he do what he did? He did what he did so that the church would not have any excuse to throw at him. Because he knew the people in that church. He knew what was going on. He knew there were some that were busy, busybody instead of working. And he didn't want to give anyone an excuse or a temptation to say, well, Paul's over there. We're providing for him. He's not working. Why am I any different? No. I hope you catch that in this chapter. He is not giving them any room to say or an accusation to say that he is not living above reproach. It speaks to his character. It speaks to his integrity. See, Paul viewed the Christian life as one that serves, as one that is selfless, as one that puts the interests of others above our own. He said, I toil and labor Night and day. Look at verse 10 one more time with me. If you get your Bibles open there, it says, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Now, that verse alone could be applied in many ways today. Many, many ways. 
It's clear this is becoming a problem in our culture, as well as it was back then. This is their, Ecclesiastes tells us there's nothing new under the sun. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. I've heard from several missionaries who uh, don't quite, we don't quite understand how the Bible's moral ethics, the Protestant work ethic, impacts our culture around us. And when they go to these other uh, countries, many of them, who, who do not have a, a work ethic that is built off the scriptures, they see all kinds of things. People who are just trying to get by or just do enough to get by or, or people who mooch off, uh, off the, the work of others. And, and that's totally not what we see in the scriptures. Now, we have our own issues, don't we? Many are workaholics. They, they probably work just a little bit too much. There's others who like to avoid it. Uh, I heard one more person say it, they work a phobic, right? They, they don't want to do anything, right? We have both in our society. So what's the Bible say? What's the Bible say about work? Here you go. First, work is part of the creation mandate. Even before the fall, Adam was told to work the soil. Keep the ground. He was told to work. That's pre-sin. There was no sin in the world at that time. He was told to work. So this creation mandate to work flows from before sin to after sin. We are to work now as well. We are mandated by God. Second, God commands us to work. We find that in Exodus. What did he say in the Ten Commandments? Remember the Sabbath. Well, that implies what? That we're working hard the other six days so we can have a Sabbath in our life. Third, God models this work for us. We can go back to creation. Psalm 19 is a good passage that tells us all that God did in creation. He models that work ethic to us. And then last, work is a gift from God. When we labor out of love for our Lord, we put on display the genius of God who created each of us uniquely to reflect his beauty. Colossians 3 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. One uh, theologian, John Stott, who I respect greatly, he said, Work is the expenditure of of energy, manual or mental or both, in the service of others, which brings fulfillment to the worker, benefit to the community, and glory to God. You see, this is what the many in this church have forgotten. They forgot what work really was all about. It, it's really not about us, although we're to provide for our families, all those types of things. However, they've forgotten the real motivation for why. And there's several reasons for that. It, in Jewish, they had, had many Jews in their in their church. In, in Jewish backgrounds, many said, if you weren't a scribe, then your work wasn't really all that great, right? Uh, the Greek, the Roman cultures, they, they taught that and believed that if you were if you were working, that meant you were like down there with servanthood. They they thought very low of those who were actually the manual laborers in their culture. In that church, we've read all along. What did they think was happening? What did Paul address last week? They thought the return of Christ had come. So they're thinking, why am I working at all? Christ has already come. Or if he's coming back today, right? Why should I work at all? This is the mindset that many in that church was going through as Paul is addressing this issue. Paul's making it clear. This is not the way of the Christian. The Christian life is meant for so much more. So what's the counter? What's he giving? First, he says, work quietly. Work quietly. You don't need a pat on your back every time you do your job. Work quietly. Don't make a big deal about it like the Greeks and Romans did. Earn your living. Work hard for what you have and provide. And then last, do not grow weary in doing good. And that can be taken several different ways, right? Sometimes work can get tiresome, can get bored, whatever it may be. We don't like it. Uh, continuing every night doing the dishes, right? And uh, we have four little dishwashers, or three little dishwashers now, but still, you don't like doing it, right? You don't like taking out the trash when it's 
10 below zero, right? You don't like doing these things that are part of everyday life that we all go through. And yet, what's he say? Do not grow weary in doing good. Because when we are doing our work to the glory of God, who gets the credit? Who gets the praise? God does. And we are a testimony to those around us of what that looks like. Doing our work to the glory of God. It's not about us. It's about Him. The second way many interpret this passage. It can get very hard to do good for others. And they, in turn, don't step in. They don't want to work when we're still doing good. Uh, or, if on the flip side, they don't show any appreciation for what we're doing for them. And, I, and we've all been there. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Paul's wanting them to not lose heart. Don't give up on doing good for others. Truthfully, we don't know when that one time might be that the, the switch kind of flips, right? The switch flips in our head and they say, oh, yeah, why are they people doing this? I, I remember... Um, going to some homeless shelters back when I was in high school and helping some individuals and we'd, somebody would share a message and then we'd talk and there was one time this guy he, he would come up and he would kind of talk with us and no big deal but one time uh, he, he was like man why do you guys do this why do you guys come here there's nothing in it for you there's nothing you get from this there's nothing you benefit from this why do you guys keep coming here and doing this and sharing this message and you know, we're like, well, you know, we, we believe everybody needs to hear the gospel. Everybody needs to hear about Jesus. That if there's someone in need, we want to serve. And it took months, maybe even a year. And at some point, that guy switched place. And the guy said, he was asking the question, why? And we told him, it's because of Jesus. And at that moment, the guy understood. And he began to believe this message. That Jesus was worth it. And we never know. And we never know what our testimony is speaking to someone else out there who needs to hear about Jesus. And if we have a poor work at it, if we have a poor attitude, if we say, no, I'm done with that person, what does that say to the lost world around us? We destroy our testimony when we do that. Do not grow weary in doing Now, Paul into this passage. What's he do? He, he talks about the one who says, I've heard all this. I see what you're doing. I'm still not going to do it. It's the person who will not repent, who will not listen to the scriptures, who says, I, I'm not going to do this. What's he say? Mark that person down. Take note of that person. Mark this person down. Have nothing to do with them. That's an interesting phrase because in the Greek, it's more of uh, the concept of mixing it up. Like, I'm only hanging out with this person, but maybe this person isn't quite the influence they should be. So I need to mix up my social interactions. I need to hang out with some other people who are living for Jesus in this situation. That's what Paul is getting at. Mix it up. And then let shame, what's he say? Let shame run its natural course. We don't make them feel ashamed. They feel the shame because if they're truly a believer, any believer caught in sin will ultimately begin to feel that shame of not living for Jesus. And, and that's what he's getting at. Last, he says, love them by confronting them. Now, this concept we're actually going to deal with next week. Um, I, I've talked about church discipline. We dealt with it a little bit last summer as we were going through our doctrinal statement. But I, I want to spend a whole Sunday just talking about what is church discipline? Why is it necessary? Why is it helpful? And when should we do it? But here's the passage, a little glimpse of what we'll look at next week. Matthew 18. And I'll say more so. This is the process. If you have conflict in your life, Someone says something, sins against you. This is how we deal with it. Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, 
you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax We'll deal with this next week. This is the model of how to handle the problem. This is the model for how to deal with somebody who will not repent. And that's what Paul is getting at here. This is a believer who will not repent of their sin. This is how we handle it. Again, I'm going to dive into it a lot next week. But here's the ultimate goal. Stay faithful. Work hard. And Paul ends it like this. Treasure peace. Verses 16 and 18 through 18. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Knowing that God is with us should give us peace. There's ups and downs in life, right? Sometimes we'll experience that peace in different ways than at other times. But God is a God of peace. And I don't know everyone's battle that you're facing right now. Maybe it's physical. Maybe it's mental. Maybe it's a spiritual battle. You're just you're just wrestling through right now. And maybe there's, uh, like I spoke of, there, there's some kind of sin in your life that you're trying to get rid of. And you just... You're like, God, I just need you to help me right now to get past this thing. He promises peace. See, Paul, he's writing this with his own hand. That's important, too, because remember, there was somebody faking to be Paul that was writing that church, trying to lead them astray. So Paul's saying, no, this is my hand. I'm writing this. I'm saying this. Listen here, because the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. You see, when we're going through those moments of trial, of temptation, of struggle, of that fight, the daily fight that just can be hard and our anxiety levels can rise, our, our depression rises, and all these different things that go on in our lives are like, man, what do I do with all this? How do I have, how can I find peace in the middle of all these things? It comes from Jesus. Treasure. Only Jesus can give. I'll leave you with one verse. Philippians 4, 8 through 9. When life seems to be going crazy, when life seems to be up and down, up and down, we don't know where to turn. Treasure the, these two verses. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. See, I, I understand the battle often is in the mind. We, we struggle and we have different thoughts that come in and say, we say no here and other times it's just like, I just can't say no to this thing. Well, where's the battle at? It's in the mind. But what he's saying here is, here's what to do when that battle starts raging and we don't know where to turn. Here's where we turn. Think of things that are true. Think of things that are honorable. Think on things that are just and pure and lovely and commendable and excellent and worthy of praise. This is where the battle for peace rages in our life. And what's he promised? The God of peace will be with you. You are not going through this alone. The God of peace will be with you. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit working in your life at all times, every moment of the day. Trust the Spirit. Rely on the Spirit. Be in the Word because that is what the Spirit uses to help us in these moments of need. Stay 
faith, work hard, treasure peace. That's our marching orders from Paul. As we wrap up 2 Thessalonians, stay faithful, work hard, treasure peace. No, the world's not going to understand this. Uh, they just won't. Our culture won't understand this. And they may persecute you. They may make fun of you. They may question you. They may criticize you. But those of us who are believers, who are Christians, we have been bought with a price. Those of us who have been saved by the precious blood of Jesus, we know that living for Jesus is worth it. So stay the course. Stand firm. Trust in the Lord. If you're sitting there, and this is all sounding foolish, crazy, like you're like, no, what was it? Right? I think you need to ask yourself some very hard questions. Have you really believed this gospel? Have you really repented of your sins and cried out to Jesus and said, save me? I need Jesus because without him, no hope. There's no hope. Paul's made that clear. There's no hope without Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. Confess your sins to him. Repent and change and believe in him with your eternal soul today. Questions? Come ask me. I'd love to walk through that with you this morning. <coughs> Father, thank you for today. I'm grateful for this opportunity to open up your word and be challenged and very challenged this past week as I began diving into this chapter. And I pray that it is challenging to those listening today, but also an encouragement. Because as you have given us commands, you have given us uh, orders that we should follow, we also know that you are there to equip us to accomplish them. You give us the grace we need daily to accomplish what you have called us to do. And we thank you for that. We're, we're not alone. We know you are with us. And I pray that we will hold fast to those truths when life likes to throw the curve. Lord, help us to trust you, stand firm, be courageous, and ultimately give you all the glory. In your name I pray. Amen. All right. Please stand with me as we sing our final song.